Thanks very much for the pause. So this project is about some prototyping work we've been doing on .NET, sort of research ideas of how to add manual memory management to .NET. Uh, so this is basically about five of us in MSR research in Cambridge, and we had three great interns, uh, Aaron Blankstein, Jonathan Balkind, and Dylan McDermott, who've contributed a lot to the project. So, oh, stunning. Okay, so, um, oops, sorry, click. Okay, so what we're interested in is manual memory scenarios. You've got big data, you've got big data operating analytics or machine learning, document indexing search, basically doing stuff over tons of memory. And then actually when you want to get the data in these big sort of cloud scenarios, it's actually really expensive to go to storage, so you cache lots of it. So you've got big caches as well. So there's tons of stuff you want to keep resident. So maybe 20, 40, 60, I think we're talking to some people with 80 gig resident live set, right? This is a lot of memory to try and GC. And you've got these multi-core machines. So they've got tons of cores, you've got tons of memory. And sometimes you see production systems with fairly high GC time. So they're spending a lot of time, 30, 40, 90, not very often 90, something's normally wrong if it's 90. But you, a fair percentage of time in GC, or sometimes you don't see very much time in GC, but they're using way more memory than they should be because they've delayed a long time to actually do the collection. And sometimes you get pauses. That's great. But wonderfully did for a joke. Um, so GC can really become a bottleneck for deploying some of these scenarios into this really big data intensive world. So what do people do? So there's tons of ways people work around this. So there's a great paper on this uh, streaming analytics engine from Microsoft Research that's part of like some of the Azure framework now. And they get really great performance. What do they do? They do pooling. So they go and implement their own memory management in a GC language. So they bypass GC. Then you see sort of research papers like Broom and Yak, which are going and adding regions to um, a GC language. So again, trying to get the GC not to do any work, right? They're sort of bypassing the GC. So what we're proposing to do is add a form of manual memory management to .NET. So why would manual memory management be easy? <laughs> um, so if you look at this piece of code, you have this wonderful point where this line here, um, so this is from the system link library, is doing some join operation, and here it's building some lookup data structure that's for one of the enumerations that it's joining, and then at the end of here, it's no longer necessary. We've finished doing all the work, we could throw it away. And this looks like a perfect case where you do stack allocation. However, Java has this, sorry, C Sharp has this wonderful, <laughs> C Sharp has this wonderful feature, yield return, which converts the code into a closure. So this is actually dynamically scoped. It can live in some sort of more interesting way, and it can't, it's not a stack anymore. It's a closure which is on the heap. So, but this object might not live very long, because it's allocated when we do some work and then it goes away. But things like this move next or the result selector could do tons of allocation. So they can push things into old generations. So GC works really well with a generational hypothesis, but when you have lots of long-lived data, which you then suddenly know goes away, there's a real opportunity here to make some wins. So what we found was by actually taking account of some of these places where data has really well-defined lifetimes, we can actually get, say, a 2x improvement in peak working set or 2x improvement in throughput, depending on how the GC is operating. So key design goals for what we're up to. So we want to be memory safe, so single-threaded, multi-threaded has to be safe. It's a safe language, we can't compromise on that. And then there's some kind of more awkward things. We have to be backwards compatible, so we have to run all existing code. So we can't just, say, throw away the GC, that would be a pretty bad idea because no one's code would work. So we have to do something that integrates correctly. And one of the kind of things that people care about is not regressing performance of existing code. So everything we do has to not break any existing code, not only in terms of running, but in terms of performance, which is kind of a pain, because that means you can't do anything that's on a path that already exists. And we want it to be pay as you go. So if you use this feature, you can get benefits, but if you don't use it, you can just opt in in little places and do 
basically your sort of profile guided optimization. Look where you want to change stuff and change it. So we have an API for this to make it uh, exposed in a way that satisfies these constraints. So it's the Owners and Shields API. And this allows us to get non-blocking safe manual memory management combined with GC and .NET. So the rough idea is you have these owner pointers. So here we've got some pointer, owner of T, that points to some object in the manual heap. And then when the owner pointer goes away, we're going to reclaim the object. So, oh, we've done unique pointers. Well, that's kind of a bit restrictive. So what we also allow you to have is shields. So these shields can be on the stack, and they can also reference this object. So the shields are basically stacked lifetime accessors, and then we've got one owner accessor that's in the heap. So one place where in the heap we know that it's live, and then lots of places potentially on the stack using the shield. And this allows us to do lots of operations on a data structure while not having to kind of do all the kind of typical exchanging out and single threaded access. So we can get multi-threaded access to these objects, but we still have a well-defined lifetime because of using the owner. So we have an API, uh, which is kind of straightforward. So owner is just a struct type in C-sharp, so this means it's a thin wrapper around a pointer. It's exactly the same size as a pointer. And it has a move operation, just like your kind of move semantics you get with a unique pointer. And then we have abandon, which says null this out, and I want to reclaim the object. And then we have defend, which is the interesting one. So this gets us a shield. So this is how we want to get our thread local access. So if we want to access this object, we defend it. And then that's going to put something on the stack which we can use. So then the shield is also a struct, which is slightly bigger than a pointer. It's two pointers. Um, and that allows us to actually access the value, the underlying T object. And it also has a dispose operation for when we want to clear it. So this is basically going to be a kind of a scoped lifetime. So a bit like the sort of lifetimes in Rust, we're going to access the object through this lifetime. So if we took some standard code from the list library, so here's a find operation, where there's some items array, it does some find on it, uh, matches objects, whatever. So if we want to rewrite, oops, wrong way, rewrite this. So now we change the actual internal data structure to be an owner of T array. So now this is an array that's in our manual heap. Then when we want to actually use it, so during this find operation, we have to defend. So we call defend on the items, which gets us a sheet. That's, uh, we call defend on it, but gets us a shield of the items. So this is now a, a, a lifetime where we can actually access the underlying data structure. So throughout this using block, which is kind of a, a feature of C Sharp for doing uh, st static scoping of um, resources, we can actually use this S items. And inside here, when we actually want to get a value, we do S items dot value, and then this gives us a way to access that object. Well a multi-threaded way, so other threads can be accessing this at the same time. So what's happening lifetime-wise? So you can kind of think of it like this. You have an object in the manual heap, it starts out, it's created, at some point it's abandoned. And then the shields are kind of like taking extra sort of protection on when it survives to. So a shield can be defending it, you can access the value, and then at some point you dispose, and then you're not allowed to use that value anymore. But moreover, you can the delete is sometime after the abandon. So it isn't prompt deallocation in the same sense as you would get with unique pointer. So with unique pointer in C++, when you abandon, get rid of it, it's gone. Right? Any, any pointers to it, your problem. Right? Here, if you've taken a shield out and someone abandons it, we'll keep it alive. So the shield will actually allow us to continue to access the value even after the point at which it's abandoned. And as part of the runtime, we'll calculate when there are no longer any shields and when it's been abandoned. And that's the point at which we can collect. So we'll do some delaying of this to guarantee safety. So this is the typical thing. If you want to be safe, you have to do things slightly slower, reclaim slightly slower. But by batching this up, we find we still get good performance. So I'm just going to talk a bit about a couple of small case studies we did. Uh, there's a lot of data in the paper. I'm just going to present two sets of graphs on here. There's 30 graphs in the paper. So if you want graphs, read the paper. I'm going to try and get through as much content as I can. Uh, so this is also comparing to the workstation GC on the slides. In the tech report, we also compared to server GC for .NET. So there's different versions of GC. So we took um, 
the ASP.NET caching, which is a multi-threaded cache. Um, it's on GitHub. Uh, we took a task where workers basically look up keys. If the thing's not there, it adds it to the cache. And if it is there, it just returns it. And there's a sliding expiration window, I think, of one second. To do this port, it was pretty straightforward. The cache basically remains pretty much unchanged, except for the entries in the cache become owners. So we have an owner to the actual entry in the cache. And when you want to access the cache, you pass it a shield. And then it fills in the shield with the correct data so you can actually access it thread locally for that period. So what we found with this is that you get, so here we've got uh, red is the GC and blue is the manual operations. The left-hand side is time to completion. So you've got uh, small, medium, and large objects. I think small is 256, medium was 2K, and large was 4K. So what you see, this is time to completion. So we're getting almost a 2X improvement in the time it takes to run the benchmark. So in the same number of requests being handled, it's getting better. Um, at the high thread count level. So this is kind of at the eight thread end, and down here it's kind of one thread, two thread. So the one, two thread is much closer. And you see a small decrease in peak working set in this particular example for um, pretty much across the board. Um, so we have another example that we did where we took the link library, so motivate us to the beginning. And we applied this to a classic set of benchmarks from TPCH. Um, and we just went through and replaced all the internal data structures with owners. So we could, when we finished enumerating, we can deallocate the objects. This becomes a drop-in replacement for link. And when we did that, we found overall we did do quite an in, uh, improvement in memory. So let me help you read this graph. So anything here is a, a dead heat in both memory and time. The further we go this way, the better we're doing in time. And the further we go this way, the better we're doing in memory. So somewhere like here, is basically a dead heat in time, but is the G we're using, uh, the GC's using 60% more memory than us. Uh, and then you get things over here where the GC is using about 60, 50, 60% more memory and 50, 60% more time. So what you see for this sort of big scatter plot is that overall we pretty much always win on this example with memory, but the throughput isn't always a, an improvement. So sometimes there's drastic improvements and sometimes there's regressions. Um, so I'm going to try and cover some implementation in the remaining couple of minutes, which is going to be quick. So if you don't get it, I'm sorry, there's, there's a paper. So we had to do stuff that pretty much the whole stack. So there's a C sharp from front end, which we modified to do the guaranteeing that the shields are used correctly. There's some libraries, so the, core, the system link, collections, etc. we modified. Then there's a thin shim, which is the, the shim on the runtime, which we modified to expose owners and shields. And then in the VM, we integrated with the GC to allow pointers in all kinds of directions, uh, added a memory manager, and um, the shield runtime. So what I'm going to tell you now is about the shield runtime in, until I get minutes. Excellent. I can do it slowly. Cool. OK. So the shield runtime. So what we'd like to do is know how to, when we can deallocate something safely. And that's really the entire point of every bit of memory management technology. It's when is it safe to get this object back. GC does this by scanning what's live. So here we're going to do it by using these shields. So we'll have some thread local spaces, which are basically where we're saying what we're accessing thread locally at the moment. So if we want to access this object, so thread one is going to put into the shield array x, because it's about to access it and then it can start accessing it through its stack. Now, at some point, say thread two swings this pointer away, so it's gone, and now it can put it into its delete queue. So when, now when thread two decides it should look at all the shields and say, oh, X is here, I can't deallocate it. And then at some point, X goes away, and it will go again, oh, is X anywhere? X isn't here, I can deallocate it. So that's basically a very sort of it's like a GC, but a very minimal GC in effect. It's just looking at a very particular set of things. Now, how do you make this actually? So that sounds great. And if it was that simple, it would be easy. And we wouldn't have a paper. So what goes wrong? Well, when we're doing this set shield, it's very simple. It's just an assignment into the array. And when we're doing the abandon, it's just an interlocked exchange to get to find we are the person that deallocated it. 
So when is it okay to know that we're going to do the actual deallocation? What, how long do we have to wait? Because there's weird effects like weak memory and stuff that are going on. So what we could do is wait till there's a GC. Because the GC stops the world. We've got a really good point. We could just do that. And, oh, hang on. But this is actually two instructions. So we have to be a bit careful. Because if the GC were to stop us in, in the middle of that, it would actually be unsound. Uh, but thankfully, .NET gives us a wonderful way of saying, uh, don't stop me in this place because this is a, a, a core runtime function. So that's easy to implement. But waiting for a GC might be a bit, a bit gratuitous, um, particularly if you've got lots of stuff going on just using manual memory. You don't really want to stop the world for that. So what we do is we introduce um, epochs. So epochs are a standard technique in a lot of the distributed systems and concurrent algorithms literature to deal with not having up-to-date information. So you keep epochs to keep track of when things are sort of live enough. So now we do the same example. So we um, add the shield to our local runtime. And then, oh, that, was, that wasn't the button I wanted to press. Uh, so we add the shield. Um, so we've got the pointer there. And now the object goes away. And when the object goes away, we record what epoch it was in which we deallocated it. So this is keeping track of sort of how up to date I am with respect to everyone else at this point. So now if the epochs advance a little while, in particular three, uh, read the paper for justification or ask a question offline, um, then once it's gone up by three and the point and the shield's no longer there, so the shield goes away, we can actually claim the subject soundly even given all weak memory behavior, so across different, different systems. Because the, what we're doing with the epoch protocol is guaranteeing we know that everything everyone else has seen will have propagated by the time the epochs advance three times. We're going to know everything that was in the shield runtime before we abandoned, we can now see. And this is kind of cool. But there's a slight problem with epochs. Is what happens if the following? So we'll start again. Um, We've got this object, we make a shield to it, and we deallocate it, it gets put in there, and the shield goes away, but now this thread stops incrementing its epoch. So we, our epochs can kind of go up, and we kind of keep these epochs going up, but this thread just doesn't do anything now. And it's, maybe it's in a tight computation loop, it's doing something horrible, and its epoch isn't advancing. So what can we do? So we play a lovely trick, which is we virtual protect, or m protect, the array in which it's going to write to, to make it read only. So now, if it tries to change this, it will get an access violation, and we'll trap it, and we'll uh, do some appropriate patch up code to rejoin the protocol. But otherwise, we can just ignore it, because at that point, it's now got read only one. Everyone's going to see an accurate snapshot, and we can just ignore it as far as the epoch protocol is concerned. So we can we don't have to worry about waiting for it to advance its epoch. Um, and I've run out of time, so I'm just going to say, if that didn't make any sense, sorry. Um, but it works. Um, so what you see generally is there's a good reduction in peak working set, um, mainly because of prompt deallocation, because we can deallocate, each thread can deallocate independently without stopping the world, and you can get back uh, objects much more quickly than waiting for a GC. There's generally sort of a mix of uh, throughput improvements to degradations. So actually doing the manipulation of the shield runtime, putting things in thread local state can be expensive. So if you have lots of pointer chasing programs, then you're going to do a lot more work than you would if you're just doing a GC. So you have to play the trade-off game. But it is pay as you play. So you pick the bits you want, you write them the way you want them to be, and you can get some wins if you just take both places. And with that, I'll say questions. <laughs>